now a specially commissioned short film which investigates the possibilities of making films in the Britain of the 80s from the point of view of an independent filmmaker. And what, he asked himself, for it was late at night and he was in his bath, dreaming for the umpteenth time of starting a film. What if cinema had been removed to take place elsewhere than in the Odeons? What if some of the powers of cinema, such as myths and bindings, some would call it glue, had moved from the silver screen to every outside location but the cinema, the Houses of Parliament, page three of The Sun, the Falklands, television soaps. However much he averted his eyes and closed his ears and put draft excluders all around his windows and doors, this new fiction, like some blot from outer space, seeped through his head at all hours of the day and night. It was as if someone was getting up every morning to direct their particular film of England. With four million extras, it was proving to be an expensive epic. And we, poor lame ducks that we were, he thought to himself, we who had lost our political tongues long ago, what if we suddenly found ourselves unable to tell other stories, so deeply were we implicated? The noise that this new fiction was making was so powerful that it was drowning out all other dreams. He had been there many times in that room, walking almost with his eyes shut. He could hear the museum's whirrings and workings. Where will you go? Almost immediately, in about two weeks' time. The train for Ketchworth is now arriving at platform three. He could remember hearing all those calls and those cries and commands for the creation of a national image. He could see all those fingers pointing across the seas and pleading, they have one, why can't we? All those petitions, government white papers, reports, all night meetings, letters, phone calls, handshakes and promises, all those activities which repeated themselves year after year to create a national film industry had all come to nothing. And the museum's drawers, full of broken promises, were still waiting to be filled with more. To be British, that singular obsession, that plea for containment and self-sufficiency, that desperate attempt to will a nation to look at itself in the mirror, that is who you are, brought back like schoolchildren to the scene of their crime and to be told continuously, that is what you are. As if the cinema existed just to reinstate you in a natural order of things. 
we all knew who we were meant to be. We were conspiring in that activity all the time. There had to be other reasons to go to the cinema than just to look at what we already knew. England was so small that those in power could make of it what they wanted. Any metaphor would do. A hospital, a school, a family, a relationship. If he wanted to write a simple sentence like, I love you, he knew that he would have to filter it through the barricades of class and nation. Maybe it was easier to see Trevor Howard and Celia Johnson breathe in a cinema in Paris where both time and distance could afford their love affair the room to be singular and not be caught up as part of a national neurosis. Knowing that if images were to survive economically, they now had to be sold as ambassadors of a nation. He nevertheless longed for that moment of silence, that illumination, that would not be sucked in by the breath of nationalism. It was precisely because England was so small that the cinema had to enlarge it, rather than, as it has been doing for a long time, sentencing images to years of national servitude. After you'd hacked away at class, gender and nation, there was still the imagination and that could not be chained. I don't think I'm anything really, I just feel tired. Forgive me? Forgive you for what? For everything. For meeting you in the first place. For taking a piece of grit out of your eye. For loving you. For bringing you so much misery. I'll forgive you if you forgive me. However much he wanted to free himself from those nationalist concerns, he also knew that he could not rid himself of them. He had to learn how to deal with them and not wish himself elsewhere. Images were not born alone parentless, innocent of their past. All he had to do was shut his eyes and on rushed this illness that half gave him pleasure, half pain. It was a malady of on-rushing images that never seemed to stop. And if his room had become a museum that he could never seem to get out of, at least amongst a din of those past images, he knew that in the last decade there had been struggles and battles which had rightly laid claim to new realities. All those men and women who day in, night out, met, discussed, wrote and willed changes in their daily lives. Cinema had not even begun to give voice to these new realities. It was amongst these struggles and battles that he dreamt of seeing these new hopeful privacies that would burst the national intent. At 7.30 a.m., 
For a short half hour, all hopes and dreams vanished as the state lumbered through the door with all its usual series of pleasant alarm calls. For a brief time, his museum closed its doors. Idle fancies and hopeful dreams folded themselves back into their dummy-like state as the day began to bark out its demands. And it would not be right to do an amnesty for those who really have committed terrible crimes. He was, like most other people, a member of a community, a family, and a state. And his relationship to all three had definite rules and regulations, which, in the 19th century, would have made his fellow artists laugh with contempt. You can dream all you want, he thought to himself, but every week you have to make so much, be taxed so much. That fiction was real enough. He looked at the 19th century ghosts, and if he secretly envied them their past freedoms, and felt sorry for his present servitudes, he was nevertheless happy to be in close contact with something other than his museums, which did not stop him going back there every night to see if there was still the possibility of making a new image. He went back every night to that woman sitting in the car. He wanted her to be in control of her own destiny. He wanted her to talk softly, still, quietly. He didn't want any of that English theatre acting which tries so hard to prove the actor's existence as opposed to letting us assume that they do. He just wanted to be able to look at her face without having the price tag round her neck. And if she was in a room, he did not want it so furnished that people would be spending most of their time peering at the library shelves to read the titles of the books she was reading. He kept on changing the contents of the image. She changed seats. She stared out. It stopped raining. She switched on the radio. He kept on and on until he could find the perfect frame. Sometimes it was beneficial to think of an image like a letter in the form of a photograph that he could pass from hand to hand and asked the receivers what they thought. Had they seen this woman? Did they recognize the picture, the composition, the style? What did it suggest to them? As soon as the image began to move, he was amongst the audience in the cinema and was thinking how that image would fill the screen. Would it be in Cinemascope, in Panavision, Academy Frame? And what would the audience be doing? He thought of all those past visits to the cinema, the grumbles in the toilet, the mustard leaking from the hot dog, and the headache that ensued from seeing a short, a quarter of an hour of commercials, 20 minutes of trailers, and then the silence as the ice cream lady came to be spotlit with no customers, as they were all freezing cold. Older people had told him how going to the cinema in the 30s or 40s was like being on an ocean liner. Promenades and concerts, tea and murmur gentilities, an occasion and a warmth. Nostalgia alone was not going to sustain that dream. 
There had to be another reason to keep on giving water to the dinosaur. He thought back over the years, and with shame, remembered how for years the ranks and the ABCs had turned these palaces into ruins without a word of protest. No single act of brutality, just a slow dripping waste until we had forgotten what we had lost. And now all we had left were a few pressure cookers in the center of cities surrounded by desolation. <laughs> Front stalls 380, rear circle 450, and dress circle five pounds. Please have your money ready when you reach the cash desk. When his image had just been a photograph, it had been containable. He could hold it and look at it. When he animated it, it moved into another world. He knew for sure that his image, if it was to exist, would have to defeat the concept of a nation as seen through its cinema. He wanted to see a whole series of voices which by any means possible would show that we were not endlessly corrupt or endlessly noble, but that we were imaginative enough to invent and show new realities. He wanted to restore hopeful privacies and public freedoms. All that he could hope for was that if you went into the cinema feeling shaky, you wouldn't come out of it as if you'd digested bad food, as if those who'd elected themselves as gods had failed you. Absolutely will not stop. Ever. Terminator. It's bad enough having to sit there in the cold without always having to watch the film through your eyes. Why can't you sit still for one minute? Do you know what it's like? You sigh, you get up, you come back and you moan. A film's a film, not a school exam. I don't want to hear the bile and the noise of your petty-minded criticisms. I come here because I want to enjoy myself, damn it. And that, these days, is hard enough to do. I'll wait for you. You're late, as ever. The trailer comes on, you get up to get an ice cream. The film comes on, you complain about the projection. And if it's not about that, it's about the ice cream. I don't care if it's a bad film. I do, but you make me not care. It's the one night we can go out and you make a misery of it. All I want is to have a good time. It's 10.30 in Rayner's Lane. The fog's coming down and we're rowing all because of a film. And what, he thought to himself, if it really was all over, that the cinema was for burning, and that he was like a child who threw stones to stop the wind. He was still in his bath, dreaming up his umpteenth program for the survival of cinema. He was dreaming of a cinema that would be under control of the local community. It would have creches, and it would be a point of assembly where the need to be with others to see images on the big screen had been reclaimed as a right. That the cinema would be a hall of debate 
as well as being a dark chamber. And that the cinema would be a counterpoint to all those political fictions that weighed so heavily on the imagination. And so, little by little, cinemas would become once more an ocean liner, albeit a smaller one. It was now 12 o'clock at night, and he got out of his bath. He had made his film, reconstructed his cinema, all that was left was the humble task of making it real. details about government film policy are given on our fact sheet. Just send a stamped addressed envelope to Visions, PO Box 4000, London W3 6XJ. And next month's Visions, on May the 29th, reports from this year's Cannes Film Festival, with exclusive news and interviews.